You're listening to Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hey there, readers, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, and we are really in for a treat today. I recently moderated an event in Scottsdale. It was an incredible author event, great lineup, and among the phenomenal speakers was Larry Loftus, and listening to him talk about his work, I just knew that I had to bring him here on the podcast to share this with you. So Larry Loftus is the New York Times and international best-selling author of four nonfiction thrillers. He has a law degree from the University of Florida and encyclopedic knowledge of World War II and very likely, if needed, could beat you up because he practices Brazilian (laughs) jiu-jitsu and is in really good shape. So, you know, if you have to um, be submitted in some uh, situation, uh, you know, we know that that Larry is the guy to do it. Uh, He's joining us to talk about his new book, which is The Watchmaker's Daughter, The True Story of World War II Heroine, Corey Ten Boom. So, Larry, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to get to see you again and talk about this really phenomenal book And I think, as I told you uh, when we met in person, this is just not the type of book that I gravitate to. And I was so glad that I read it in anticipation of our event together because it really was phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, Pleasure being on with you, Olivia. And you did a great job moderating at that Brandeis event, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to start by by letting you explain to me, because I, I did a double take even when I was going through the books that we were would be talking about at the event. And I said, what is a nonfiction thriller? And that was a whole genre that I didn't even know existed. Did you create this genre, Larry? And, and tell us all about it. I think I did create it <laughs> uh, because they're sort of oxymoronic. You think of uh, nonfiction as a biography or a history book, and then you think of a thriller as a, a fiction story, you know, something by Vince Flynn or Brad Thor or someone like that. And um, when I first started, I had an agent that I submitted my manuscript for, for Into the Lion's Mouth, the red book right there. And he said, uh, is, I'd written it as historical fiction. And he said, is most of this true? And I said, it's all true. And he said, well, just do it all as narrative nonfiction. Let's just go nonfiction. Um, and I just, because I like thrillers, that's what's fun to me to read, turning the page, getting excited, getting your heart, heart rate going. Um, so I just merged the two genres. So I can't make anything up. I can't invent dialogue. So every word in every book that you see in dialogue is verbatim from a primary source. All the citations are in the back of the book. The end notes are in the back of the book. You can check, uh, to see where everything came from but I can't make anything up. What I can do is decide where chapters end. That's up to me. Mm -hmm. So when, when there's a dead body, when there's a gun, when there's something, some type of activity, a briefcase that was just stolen in the case of Codename Lease, then I can end the chapter there and it leaves the reader saying, wait, wait, what happened? What happened? What happened? And so that's what a thriller is. So uh i just do that from beginning to end i mean the tough part to me is to find a story that has a lot of those a lot of that excitement a lot of that drama a lot of that tension a lot of that hitchcock type feel um and so i have to look hard i mean for every one that i find i find four that won't work but um it's once i find one then i just structure it as a thriller yeah it's really it 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 uh it does i mean it reads ju- just like a thriller but you know that these are real people in real events and you're you you're stressed out kind of from the jump because we know obviously that this was, um, you know, an incredibly perilous, dangerous, um, you know, horrific time, uh, in, in world history. Um, Corey Ten Boom, I had never heard of her. Um, but talk about how you had some reservations writing about her because she had already been pretty well documented. Yeah, it went back to um, my second book was Codename Lease about a, uh, it's that book right there, about a SOE spy operating in France. She was caught. They sent her to Ravensbrook concentration camp. And one of my friends who was re- reviewing some of my, my uh, work said, look, you need to read The Hiding Place. And I said, why? I, I knew about Corrie ten Boom. 
but I'd never read this book, that, which was a biography of her by uh, two American writers, uh, John and Elizabeth Sherrill. I'd never read the book, but I knew that basically I knew the story. Well, anyway, she's at Ravensbrook at the same time that my character, Odette Sampson, is there. And uh, it gave me a good picture because my character was a spy. She had been sentenced to death. They put her in a bunker. She couldn't see anything outside. She, she had no light. And so I couldn't see anything of what was happening around the whole. Ravensbrook was a huge concentration camp. And so Corey was on the outside. She was in the normal barracks. So with Corey's perspective, I was able to see what was happening, not only on the inside with, with my character, but what was happening all around the camp and the barracks and what the guards were doing and the beatings and all of the, the, the crematorium, the gas chamber, all that stuff so I could see the outside. And so when it was time for book number four, I wanted a different country. I'd already covered, you know, my first book was about a spy, MI5, MI6 spy operating in Portugal. Second one was SOE, Odette Sanson operating in France. Third was Elaine Griffith, OSS agent operating in Spain. And I wanted a new spy agency and I wanted a new country. Well, I'd already covered all the spy agencies, all the allied spy agencies, so that was out. But I wanted a new country. My mind kept going back to Corey's story because it would be a new country, be the Netherlands, which really suffered under the Nazi boot for five years. And although she's not, she wasn't a spy, she and her family were part of the Dutch resistance, which is very similar because the consequences are the same. If you get caught, you're either gonna be shot or sent to a concentration camp. So that kind of danger, that kind of drama, uh, in fact, was probably more intense for them because it was every day, every night, because they were in the middle of the, of the uh, lion's den, if you will, because they've got Gestapo all around them 24 seven. So that's how I segue to cover, covering Corey's story. My only reservation when I started was when the Sherrills wrote this, um, came out in 71, The Hiding Place, did they know everything about what happened? Is that all of the story? Well, and I read the book, and then I read Corey had written a number of other books, um, and there were other people related to the story that had written books. And to my surprise, The Hiding Place was less than 10% of the story. Um, the mo second most important per person in the in the story is a guy by the name of Hans Pohl, an 18-year-old Dutch person. Dutch boys had to hide too because the, the Gestapo would snatch them off the street and send them to work in a German factory because all the German men were off at war. So they would snatch up Dutch boys between about 16 to 30, 35 uh, and, and, and send them off, ne basically never to be seen again. So Hans Poli was the first permanent refugee into their home, uh, and they're called Dutch divers. They had to hide just like the Jews. And so they started taking in other people, taking in Jews, and Poli kept a diary. Corey didn't keep a diary, but this guy kept a diary every single day. And then in 1983, he wrote a book called Return to the Hiding Place. And so I had his, basically his diary, what happened every day. And then Corey's nephew, Peter Van Warden, who was Corey's sister, Nolly's son, had written his own memoir in 1954 called The Secret Place. So I had his perspective. And then, of course, I had to find out what was happening all around. You know, there was a 13-year-old girl 10 miles away in Amsterdam named Anne Frank that I, I wanted to pull into the story because she's recording things in her diary that are happening also. And like when a, when a raid comes over or a bombing, She's recording it, and it's happening in Harlem, too. Um, and so I had her perspective. But then there was another woman, another 13-year-old, not far away in Arnhem, by the name of Audrey Hepburn. And Audrey Hepburn had her own perspective. So I I, I knew, I this is the, the other 90% of the story. I have to pull all this together. All these other people, the people that, that were there in the house that, that suffered through all of this, the you know Anne Frank's perspective and Audrey Hepburn's perspective and oh by the way the German perspective what was happening with them what were the British doing the British o S O E was operating in in the Netherlands and it was very scary and a lot of people died um, I won't spoil it by telling you how they died but a lot of people died so the S O E is there and then what are the Dutch doing and then what's Queen Wilhelmina doing she's forgotten completely in our understanding of the story of World War II in the Netherlands but Queen Wilhelmina was essentially their Churchill. She was in exile. She went to England, and but she made um, deliveries. She would make speeches 
to her people, just like Churchill was making speeches to the English and the French. So anyway, it was uh, by pulling all this together, it gave me the full picture of what the entire story was. Well, it's so interesting to hear you talk about that because essentially it's like, um, you know, somebody putting, um, starting an investigation and then you're gathering all of these elements and, and you think that you maybe have only one story to tell, but you want to find these other sources and viewpoints to kind of create a, a whole experience. And I imagine as you dig deeper into your research, you probably find even more perspectives that you end up kind of putting to the side because uh, you for, for, the, for the way that your story is going to flow. I mean, you can't you can't include everything, but it's it's just it's it's amazing how you're able to go from kind of that narrow to wide view and then still have the story feel so intimate. There is a process and what I have to do. I, I, I first gather all of the information. Oh, by the way, Corey's archives, which the Cheryl's never saw because they're not collected yet. Her archives are all in the at Wheaton College. So I went to Wheaton College and did research. She had like box after box, I spent four days there. Everything, all of her passports, her letters from prison, written in Dutch, which she uh, had later translated, um, but everything, her photos from the whole family history. Uh, so I had all those files to go through. But what I have to do as I'm doing my research, remember I'm writing this as a thriller, so I can't include, as you said, I can't include everything. Mm -hmm. Is if you chase every rabbit trail, you lose the main thrust and energy that you're going after in a thriller. So what I have to do is I have to decide what goes in, what goes out, what goes in, what goes out. The problem is there's a lot of good stuff mm -hmm. that I want people to know. And so my answer, every once in a while, I have to fight my editor on what I can, you know, take that out. No, 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 it has to stay in. The I, I do this two ways. Number one, with footnotes. Occasionally, like if there's something that happens that I really want people to know, but I don't want to put it in the main story, the main text, because it'll slow the pace down, is I'll put it in a footnote so they can read at the bottom separately what happened. Or if it's longer, then I'll put it in an end note. And um, so if you look at my end notes, I didn't count how many pages. I think it's like <laughs> 65 pages of end notes, which is actually less than into the lion's mouth because there were 75 there. But that, those two things allow me to show people the bigger, wider picture without impairing the, the pace of the actual story. Without removing the thrill from the thriller. Right. There you go. <laughs> well, and, and yeah, man, that is a lot. So don't be, if you, if you are hesitant to pick up a book that feels too thick, uh, don't be too scared because, yeah, that is a lot of pages of notes. And I originally, as I told you, um, was listening to this on audio the day that it had come out and they did a very good job of reminding the listener that there is a, a PDF to download because there are so many resources, the footnotes and, and photographs that really complement this story and you don't want to miss out on that, but, but they really, the, the narrator did an excellent job of delivering this book in audio as a thriller, as you know, you're biting your nails and you're listening along and you're pausing in the car for a couple extra moments to, to go, oh my gosh, like what's gonna happen? Um, the family is very unique because they are Christians who we see the the watchmaker, the, the patriarch of the family, always have a an affinity and a special respect for um, the, the true children of Christ or, or, or the, the, those of the Jewish faith. And so that, I assume, would have been a very unusual perspective at the time. And um, it kind of set the, set the tone for a group of people who are willing to uh, really risk everything, their own safety, their own futures, to be able to push back to what they knew, what was so wrong, um, going on so wrong in their own communities. What was it about this family that, that, that sparked that that willingness to to risk it all. Yeah, it was a very devout family, and it goes back not just to Casper, their father, but actually to Corey's great grandfather, because they were all devout Christians. And early on, with with her great grandfather, a pastor had come to them and said, "Hey, we need to pray for the Jews and pray for Jerusalem," which was very odd in Holland at that point in time. But they did. And that love for the Jews and, and praying for Jerusalem, that continues to Corey's grandfather and then to her father, Casper. So you can't really understand Corey or her sister Betsy or her sister Nolly or her brother Willem without understanding the whole lineage, the whole history. 
So they had this every day. I mean, Casper, uh, what happens is Corey's mother dies at a relatively young age. So in the home, you had four children. Nolly gets married, moves out. Willem gets married, moves out. The two siblings that stayed were Betsy, her old, Corey's older sister, and Corey, and then their father, who by the time World War II breaks out is 80. So Corey at this point's already running their watch shop. Uh, her dad was, her father was a watchmaker, the best in his day, probably the best in the world. He trained her. Then he sent Corey to um, Switzerland to learn from the Swiss how to be an actual watchmaker. Uh, so she was the first li female licensed watchmaker in the Netherlands. Uh, so she comes back, and uh, and then the war breaks out. But by by then, she was already a very good watchmaker and was handling the bulk of the the sales. And of course, as typical in in Europe, you have the retail on the bottom and then the residential above. So their home was the ten boom watch shop at the bottom, and then their residential above. And all of it was part of <laughs> the drama because you had people coming into the watch shop that might have been Gestapo, might have been informants, didn't look right, didn't act right. You had people peering in from the second floor, watching them during lunch one day. And one of the resistance workers who, who was there said, okay, everybody remain calm. There's someone peering through the window. And Betsy says, well, well what's he doing? And the guy says, he's, he's washing the windows or pretending to wash the windows. And Betsy says, well, I didn't order the windows washed. And then someone else says, wait, how's that possible? There's no ledge. This is the second floor. There's no ledge. And the guy says, well, he's standing, he's on a ladder and he's peering through the curtains. Well, they've got a room full of Jews and these Dutch divers that are that they're hiding. So they know it can only be either a Gestapo person or an informant. So one of the Jews who is there, you see, who plays a prominent role in the story, says, okay, everybody just continue on as normal in a few minutes we'll sing happy birthday and they did uh and i i'll stop there because i don't want to throw out a spoiler but it was very tense because this very. can only be a Gestapo or an informant why is he up you know cleaning right. their windows they didn't order it there's no lead she's on a ladder he's peering into the curtains he waved at them and so they're all just frightened to death and this this happened every day i mean there was something it was a knock on the door at night there was a German military truck that parked directly in front of their house one night at two o'clock in the morning. You know, this kind of thing happened every single day, every single night for five years. And so that's the drama that allowed me to create this, uh, to write it as a thriller. That's, you do such a good job of the, this, of of allowing us to kind of put our, our, our feet in the shoes of these people who are living with this high level stress all the time all every single moment um and and the way that they need to um be ready to answer any question correctly um be willing be be ready to to move so quickly um to cover the their tracks so that if the gestapo comes in and raids the home that there won't be anything left behind that would suggest that they've been housing um and, and that they've been part of this this resistance um right down to even waking up members of the family in the middle of the night to make sure that out of slumber they would answer correctly and not give anything away. I mean, it's really a, a I mean, talk about a PTSD that would come out of, I mean, these experiences to the, to the you know, most extreme degree. It's just a nonstop sense of being on guard. Yeah, it's a pressure cooker. And, and my job is to bring verisimilitude where the reader feels like they're there. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're actually in the scene. And because I, the way I do my research and I have all the primary sources and I have the, I can put the dialogue of what actually was said. Um, and, and that helps the reader to feel it, if you will. Um, but yeah, that, that drama was every day. And when they got the, the hiding place, they had put, they created a, a, a fake wall at the top of um, the, the whole bay, it's what they called their house, in Corey's rooms, in the back of Corey's room. And one of the Dutch boys they had brought in was an electrician, kind of a lay electrician. Well, he wired the whole house with buzzers. So when he when he wired it, he put a, a buzzer uh, by the front door in the watch shop, the entrance door. Then he put a buzzer at Corey's desk, a buzzer at Casper, the secret buzzers. And then um, and then one in the dining room. So he put these buzzers at different places. 
And if they feared it was a German soldier, Gestapo, an informant, then they would hit the buzzer and everybody would scamper upstairs uh, and hide. And so, but it was so intense because the Gestapo would run in. And so they had to time it, how long it would take them. And the person who had designed this, this hiding place said, you need to get everybody in under a minute. And they're like, that's impossible. You know, we've got six people. We've got seven people. That, that hiding place they created only w- would hold eight. Sometimes they had nine people or 10 people or 11 people. Well, where do the other three go? Corey's nephew's there with two friends. And they're like, okay, we have no room in the hiding place. We're going to have to jump on the, go to the roof and jump across to the next building, which is about an eight foot jump. Uh, and by the way, somebody else, a couple other people have to do that at night during one raid. I won't get into, I won't spoil it, but it's, I mean, if you fall, you may die. You, at the very least, you'll break your leg, you'll get caught, you'll go to a concentration camp. Uh, but that that kind of stress was there because they had to practice. Mm-hmm. And, and they understood when the Gestapo came in, they would send agents to sk- throughout the house. And so they they would all race up and it's not just, okay, there's the buzzer, I hear it, I'll go to you know the hiding place. Well, you had to flip your bed. If you didn't turn your bed, the Gestapo's not stupid. When they walk in, they put their hand on the bed to see if it's still warm. And so you know when you've got only three people in the house and you have eight beds and they're all warm, that tells you there's more people in the house. So they would have to flip their bed then get their stuff, get their shirt, get whatever they slept in, get their their personal effects. Uh, UC had a pipe and an ashtray, so we'd have to get that. So they had to collect their stuff and all race into this room, this little hiding place. Corey had them down to 70 seconds. They could all get in in 70 seconds, which is almost miraculous. Mm-hmm. The uniqueness of this family um, parallels the uniqueness of this building. And, and you talked about what was put in to create a hiding space, but just the layout of, uh, of the building lent itself to uh, being ideal for, for what they were trying to do and, and, and for the, uh, their, their ability to complicate it when, when the Gestapo was searching for people. Um, what do you know of the building's fate? Is it still standing? Is this a historical site that is visited not, not only not only is it still standing it is preserved intact that house is now the Corrie ten boom museum oh wow and you can go there and you can visit they have hundreds of thousands of visitors in fact in Corrie's archives they she keeps the uh in, in, in wheaton college they have the guest book so the people that signed it and if you look in the back of mine you can see where you see and hans who became like best friends, returned to that place, to the hiding place, 30 years later, and they sign a special note in the guest book. But anyway, so it's still there, still preserved. And oh, by the way, they have copies of our version, the English version, which they they ordered 100 copies of. Um, and the Dutch, ver- there's a Dutch version of the book as well. That will be there too. I'm not sure when the Dutch version comes out. Um, I think it's later this year. But anyway, so in the Corey Ten Boom Museum, not only is it still there, you can tour it. You can see the rooms that we talk about in the story. Uh, the window that I just referenced when someone was walking, you can walk in the living room, the dining room, and see the window with the curtains there. They've preserved it all, and you can still see it. You can still visit it. You can go into the hiding place. They cut a hole in the brick so that you could see through because um, the entrance is very small. They built a linen, a linen closet that had a trap door at the bottom, and everybody had to crawl in. So now they, they cut a hole in it so you can walk in, but you can go in, the, in the, the actual hiding place and it's spooky because it's very small. It's like a very small closet. Um, it, the max they could put in is eight and, and uh, all the time they had to have uh, two people could stand, or, uh, two people could sit, the, other, the others had to stand because there's not enough room. Wow. And it feels like you're in a coffin. Mm-hmm. There's no ventilation. And in the story, as you know, they some people do get trapped in there with Germans in the house and they have to hide and they have no food in there and no water in there and no facilities in there. There's no bathrooms in there. And Mother Nature calls and um, they're hungry, they're thirsty, and they can't get out because there are Germans in the house. The Germans have arrested everybody else and they have no way of saying, hey, uh, Dutch resistance, we're, we're trapped in here. Can somebody come get us, come save us? And so these, there were six trapped in there, four Jews and two resistance members, and they thought they were going to die. I mean, it's the third day, and, and they're still waiting. 
And so they had to decide. I mean, it was it was just horrible. I mean, they've got no food, no water, no ventilation. Uh, they tore up sheets to, to, to urinate on so that it wouldn't seep down the walls that the Germans would notice. For the other, they had a bucket, which one of the Jews running is on, knocked over mm. uh, the, the second night. And so it's just a stench, and they're just stuck in there. And so, again, I, I won't spoil it by telling you what happens, but it was very scary. And it's all true. It's what wow. happened. And, and, and you, you can, can, go, you can, you can visit can and there. get the watchmaker's daughter there. Yes, exactly. You can go there. You can get to, you can get either the English or the Dutch version, but you can take pictures and you can actually stand in the hiding place wow. where those people stood. And you can see, as you mentioned, it was an unusual house because originally there were two that were built, two different houses side by side. One was a little higher in elevation and, and so they weren't flush. So you had these odd stairs that would that would go between and it just made it unusual. Um, and kind of difficult to navigate, which helped them because it would slow the Gestapo down as they worked their way to find, you know, where's the top of this thing. Larry, how do we adapt this skill set of yours, this writing of the nonfiction thriller, to all historical textbooks so that uh, kids and students of all ages can can be immersed in history and be excited about it and realize all of the emotion and the, the you know, the true, um, I mean, the, the, the great stories that, that people have lived through, the experiences, how interesting it is to dig deep into history. Yeah, I, I think of what Hitchcock said when he was talking about what, what is true drama, what is true uh, suspense. And he said, it's life with the boring parts taken out. <laughs> well, that's what I do. I mean, I, I have to go through mountains and mountains of, of research, and then I take all the boring parts out, and then I just put in the fun, exciting, uh, death-defying parts. And so with normal history books, and I've got uh, mountains of just regular World War II books behind me, um, they, they, can, they can be dry. They are dry. I mean, for some people, you're a World War II historian. Great. You're going to love every page. But other people want a story. They want a person they can mm-hmm. connect to. They want people that they can connect to. Um, and that's why a lot of people don't read nonfiction, because they want a story. They want verisimilitude. They want to feel like they're there. They want the excitement, the drama, the love, the, the passion. And so that's why I did what I did. I just merged two genres and made it where it's a nonfiction story that's all true, that gives you the history of what happened from the Germans and the Dutch and the English and the families to, it's it, it's a thriller. I mean, it, it, it's supposed to keep you on the edge of your seat all the way through the book. So that's the goal. You did it, goal accomplished. Uh, Larry, thank you so much for visiting with me and it was a pleasure to meet you. A real pleasure to read this book. It is, uh, it's, it's remarkable. You did a fantastic job. Um, and thank you so much for talking about this with me and uh, being able to share this with our listeners and viewers. And I assume that there's another one in the works. Yeah, I always, and by the way, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It was great talking to you, seeing you again. Uh, but there's always one of the works because it takes two years to put out a quality nonfiction book. It takes a year to do the research and then nine months to a year to, to write it. So I've already done the research for the next one. And it's about an OSS spy operating in Sweden, Sweden and actually in Germany, both uh, double agent. So that will be the next one, 2025, probably. Wow. And still still keeping up with your jujitsu. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I made sure that I didn't get any, you know, scars on my face or the internet. <laughs> What's that big red mark on the side of his face? That's a good burn. Because you know? it happens. We know that. <laughs> yeah, it does happen. It does happen. All right. The Watchmaker's Daughter is the new nonfiction thriller from Larry Loftus. Larry, thanks. Thank you, Olivia. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music. This is Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.